Hey everyone, my name is Steve Bishop, and I wanted to do a little presentation today on something I call the inverse learning theory. So I am uh, an educator by trade. I've been doing YouTube videos for a long time. I'm, uh, I actually educate in my professional career. Uh, I've been inst an instructor both in, in the golf industry and in the tech field. And so I kind of wanted to put together some of my thoughts about learning in a little bite-sized presentation. This isn't going to cover everything, obviously, because uh, adult education is, is a pretty large and varied topic. But just some of my ideas that I kind of want to put out there that I think would be worthwhile for you. So this is the inverse learning theory is what I've dubbed it. Uh, and it really comes from this idea that the best way to learn is to teach. Okay, we've heard this probably many times before that the best way to actually understand something and gain knowledge is to actually try to teach it to other people. So I kind of want to go over that a little bit and why that is. But also, I think that teachers get a bad rap. Um, quite often, you'll hear the, the colloquialism that, you know, those that can't do teach. I don't think that that's quite fair. I just think that the motivations are a little different. Somebody who is consistently seeking knowledge and seeking understanding of things, that's what I typically find in the teachers that I encounter, in the instructors that I encounter, is a desire to not stay with one particular field, but to continue learning maybe other things or, or uh, you know, tangential things about something. It just things become very interesting to us, so we don't spend as much time actually uh, perfecting a particular craft. Instead, what we like to do is learn about other crafts that kind of become uh, more jumping points. Now, if we wanted to, I think most instructors could easily go in and, and start to get, you know, deep dive into certain subjects and be able to perform just as well as anybody else. It's just that the motivations are a little bit different. So I think that there's a little bit of a, a misnomer there in that, that term that, you know, those that can't do teach. So, um, learning styles. Let's talk about learning styles right now. Uh, it's, it's, a pretty, it's been pretty well known and established out there for quite some time that individuals have a variety of different learning styles. And sometimes these are mapped out in different ways. But typically, there are three that I, I really want to hammer home on. So, you are typically made up of three different learning styles. These are the, the, the primary learning styles that I'm going to talk about. There's the visual, which means you like to see things, right? You like to have some sort of visualization, like what we see on the screen right now, right? I have a visual representation of what it is that I'm talking about. Then there's the auditory. There's the actual discussion, the learning through talking, okay? Learning through hearing, more specifically. And then also there's the kinesthetic. That's the actual doing. That's taking what it is that I may be presenting to you in this video and then actually going out in the real world and doing it and experimenting with it and kind of getting your hands dirty, getting your hands involved in, in that thing. Um, now, some of you may be asking, well, what about reading and writing? Where does that fit into this graph? And the actual answer to that is auditory. Uh, if you start thinking about it, if you are trying to write something or you try to read something, you're actually having this internal voice, right? You have an internal voice going on, an internal dialogue. That's actual auditory, right? You're, you're thinking of some sort of kind of inner voice. So I, I typically pair up reading, writing, and auditory as kind of the same skill set, the same type of learning. Uh, now, these three major learning styles, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, really make up the trifecta of knowledge, right? The, being able to understand something in its visual components, its auditory components, and its kinesthetic components uh, really kind of uh, envelops that idea of knowledge, right? That everything uh, that you understand, you can, you can represent it in visual imagery, you can talk about it, you can do it, and then once you have mastered all of those different ways, that becomes knowledge. Now, I want to take just a moment here to talk uh, kind of a, a sidebar here about there's a lot of studies regarding this and, you know, trying to determine do people actually have learning styles? Uh, is there actually one that's better for any particular group of people? That sort of thing. And most of that information actually comes out to be inconclusive. And I think that's primarily because we are made up of all of these learning styles, unless there's some sort of 
uh, you know, physical limitation. Like, you know, if you if you can't see, maybe it's a little bit more difficult, obviously, for you to learn through visuals. Uh, or if you're hard of hearing, then maybe you're not as strong an auditory. But the bottom line is these are the typical ways that we actually learn. And we should be learning through all three of them. If we tried to learn through just one of those modalities, then we don't really gain the knowledge. You have to have all three in order to gain that knowledge. So most, there may be an easier way to get in. There may be, you know, maybe I'm a visual learner. So if things are presented to me by video, I see them and understand them a little bit better, a little bit more clearly than if somebody is just saying, here's an exercise, go do it. Or maybe you're completely different. Maybe you don't like these videos very much. You just want to get some sort of exercise to go do and you'll figure it out as you go along. You, you have a primary learning style. One of these ways is typically much stronger for you to gain entry into a subject, but it is not the core of your understanding. You have to get all three modalities in order to fully have that knowledge. And that's where I think a lot of the studies kind of fall. Uh, they kind of fail to, to capture this. Is it's, it's an all-inclusive thing. It's not one or the other. Uh, so... Okay, you're this big ball of, of knowledge now, right? You've got this uh, visual representation, auditory, uh, and kinesthetic understanding of whatever that concept is. And now you encounter someone else, okay, who they themselves also have these same modalities. They have the same visual, auditory, and kinesthetic in order to make up what they know. So why is it that we uh, can actually, that the transition of our understanding, our knowledge to somebody else helps us in our understanding. What is that thing? Well, it's because when you are doing the teaching, you have to engage in the same set of learning styles, but you have to kind of invert the flow, right? I have to take this thing that I understand, and maybe I'm an auditory learner, but now I'm encountering someone who is a visual learner, so I have to create some sort of uh, material, some sort of representation that will reach out to that visual learner or the kinesthetic learner, or maybe I'm a visual learner and they're an auditory learner. So I have to learn how to talk about something in an effective way. So you have to utilize those same learning styles, but now you are inverting the flow, right? You're, you're doing that inverse learning. You're, you're, you're taking what is something of this particular type of knowledge that you have, and now you have to figure out how are you going to change your knowledge up to impart that knowledge to someone else? And that is that inversion of learning, okay? That inverse learning theory. So in order to do this type of teaching, you've got to explain concepts, right? So that's your auditory, if you're gonna explain those things. You've gotta create visuals quite often in order to help that visual learner understand what it is that you're, you know, presenting, and then you have to design some sort of activity. And if you don't do all three of these things, chances are not as good that they are going to understand it. You have to try to present all three modalities to the individual so that they can gain a complete understanding of that thing beyond just their primary learning style. So. Uh, you may discover that you, you glob on to teachers. If you are a visual learner, you tend to glob on to teachers who do a lot of great visual representation. That's great, but then once you leave the classroom, that understanding can typically fade if you don't have some of those more stressful learning styles also being performed, right? If I don't do it, you know, I may be a visual learner, but I'm a kinesthetic stress. I don't like to do things, but until I actually do it, I won't really fully understand it. I have to do that. I have to engage in the performance of the thing in order to actually fully get that knowledge, okay? So that's why I'm saying we have to encompass all three modalities to truly gain the knowledge because once I can, it, just understanding it at a, at a high level with my primary learning style is not really knowledge. It's just kind of an understanding. It's a, it's a little bit of, of that, okay, I know a little bit enough about this that I can talk about it, but I don't know how to actively do it. So therefore it's not truly knowledge. That's the type of thing that we have to make sure we're getting beyond when we are teaching that we are explaining the whole thing and providing enough material and enough uh, instruction to the other person that all three of their modalities can be enacted 
in order for them to also gain the same knowledge that you do. And because you are having to think about things in that way, you are forcefully once again engaging all three of those parts of your brain that are all part all those parts of your brains that helps you get those learning styles out how would i as a visual learner create an activity for someone else to do if i am not myself a kinesthetic learner i have to figure that out and then i have to put together something some sort of presentation perhaps or some sort of uh, code uh, code example or demo uh, and that's going to force me to actually actively myself get engaged in a learning style that may not necessarily be my primary learning style. So all of that, I think that, that hopefully shapes your understanding of why I believe teaching is one of the most effective ways of solidifying your knowledge is because you have to re-engage all of those learning styles in order to transfer that knowledge to somebody else. Now, going beyond that, I also really, you'll find that the number three is a lot uh, of, of what is, is useful out there. So I like to think of group learning in pairs of two or three. Three is really the ideal number, but you can have two if you really need to. And the, the learning, okay, the learning process alone will take uh, longer, right, if you only do it yourself. So if you are just learning all by yourself, you're just you know trying to read through the documentation, watching YouTube videos all by yourself, nobody else, it's going to take you a lot longer for you to understand that information. Now, if you try to do this with four or more people, then inevitably one of those people tends to feel left out, okay? They, either that person already understands the concept, they don't feel like they need to participate in the group activity, uh, or maybe they're the complete opposite. Maybe they're afraid to reveal that they don't understand because, hey, there's this great discussion going on between two or three people and I can't really participate in it because I don't really understand, but I don't want to appear dumb. So sometimes you'll get the exact opposite effect of, of somebody understanding that they don't understand and they don't want to reveal that. And then another very common scenario is that they just simply get distracted. That, that fourth person... Um, they, they have something come up, they, they decide to go check out their Twitter you know, feed or Facebook feed or something, or they got to go to the restroom or whatever it is, and they become distracted and they just think, oh, when I come back, we'll, you know, they'll tell me or I'll, I'll pick up on it when I come back. Uh, and that distracted level, that lack of engagement by that extra party uh, typically does not facilitate a good learning environment. So really, I found two to three. Three is the ideal number, but if you can only do two, then that's fine. Um, the other thing that this does is because you are working with somebody else, you typically tend to engage with that person to understand, to, to confirm your level of understanding, right? And you can do it immediately. You don't have to wait until the end of a presentation to raise your hand and ask questions that you probably forgot about 15 minutes into the lecture, right? You can actually, if you're trying to go through it, you can turn to your partners and say, hey, uh, I didn't quite understand that thing that, that he was talking about, or I didn't quite understand the activity. Can you explain it to me? Um, and again, that's facilitating that when you turn to your partners and ask them to inform you about something, that's once again re-engaging in this, right? They have to teach it to you. They have to re-engage and explain the concepts or, or you know, design some sort of visual. Maybe they have to pull out a whiteboard themselves and explain it, or they have to talk more about the activities, or maybe they, they create, write a little bit of code or they demonstrate it for you, right? So they have to, in order to get you, when you ask that question, they have to once again engage in this teaching. And you can confirm your understanding as you're going along uh, to ensure that you understand that concept. This also helps with the cross-pollination of skills. So I may not understand some sort of tangential subject, right? I may not quite understand. Maybe I'm trying to learn about functional programming and uh, all of a sudden tuples comes up and I don't understand what tuples means, but somebody else already does. And so they can explain tuples to me, even though that may not actually be a part of the, the immediate curriculum uh, or the immediate topic, but it helps me understand a larger set of, of circumstances around that concept because somebody else is familiar with it. 
So that, that cross-pollination of skills, the cross-understanding that can happen simply because you are in a group of three people, uh, that, that can really bring a lot of minds together on something. And then the last thing is I really believe that working as a group will help to reduce the, the feeling of that imposter syndrome. Because if you're just learning, <coughs> excuse me, if you're just learning on your own, then you don't really know if you know the right things, right? You think you may have an understanding, but until you get confirmation, you're going to feel like you might not know enough. But if you are able to have a group discussion and continue that confirmation of understanding, you're going to feel much more confident in your level of understanding. And then you're not going to feel like you're an imposter when you get into some other group. You don't feel like you have to hide how much you know uh, in case they uh, you know, they think that you don't know enough because you've already had that discussion. You've already openly admitted to others how little or how much you understand. So I really believe in group learning along with this inverse learning theory to really help establish uh, you know, that, that knowledge, that solidification of knowledge. That doesn't mean you can't learn on your own and it doesn't mean you can't learn as a group of four or more. It's just that I think that you start to get to a level of diminished returns, right? Okay, so just to recap here, learn using all three modalities, right? Learn, learn using auditory, visual, and kinesthetic modalities. That's the only way that you can truly gain knowledge. And then by all means, teach, 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 and try to think about how you're going to reach out to all three of the modalities of somebody else, right? You've got to create uh, those, those curriculum, if you will, for those other people. Okay, that you don't know what their modality is. You might be able to identify it, but you, you still need to try to engage them in all three so that they can f gain a full understanding. And then group, uh, uh, you know, group up in a pair of three. So that really will help you in the process of learning uh, to feel more confident in your level of understanding and also gain some other skills outside of it. You'll, you'll be surprised at how much more you can understand and learn if you work as a team rather than just on your own or too large of a project. So there it is. That's kind of it in a nutshell. That's kind of my inverse learning theory. I hope that you found this informative. I hope you um, like what you have here. If you please, if you did, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel and I will see you later. Thank you.